things specific. Including things specific to colleges, uh, especially uh, on the funding part and how it affects uh, participants and uh, in particular SNAP ENT and how, how it works with Pell Grants. Uh, and then we'll share some uh, different resources with you, some tips uh, about, uh, uh, particip about being a, a partner in SNAP ENT, and then uh, we'll go into the Q&A. And I'll, I'll turn my camera on, back on uh, during the Q&A. We also have some special uh, guests with us today to, to uh, give you some real world uh, uh, experiences on, with uh, administering a SNAP ENT program. We've got Eric Hennessy from uh, Nevada Department of Health and Human Services, and we have Camille Vega from uh, Truckee Community College. So you'll hear from them later on in the presentation. Go ahead and go to the next slide. As you may remember earlier in the, uh, the cohort, uh, we did a, uh, a survey to kind of uh, test, test the landscape of, uh, of you all as colleges and your experience with SNAP ENT. And one of the questions we asked was, you know, what topics uh, about SNAP ENT that you wanted to learn about? And as you can see by this slide uh, graphic that um, um, the majority of people wanted to hear about uh, an overview of SNAP ENT and uh, the different components uh, of SNAP ENT. And, and we're gonna, uh, Give you that information today and hopefully it'll be enough um, that um, it, it serves a purpose of what you needed of what you wanted next slide so a quick overview again of snap ent um, all states are required to operate snap ent programs and they have to submit a plan every year uh, and that's all part of uh, this the overall snap food benefit program uh, that they do that. And the reason is because uh, within SNAP uh, food assistance, there are certain work requirements for certain people that are uh, capable of working. Uh, so in order to meet those requirements, uh, each state will have to, has to run a SNAP ENT program. Uh, the USDA uh, Food Nutrition Service provides uh, a lot of financial support for this program. Uh, there's about $104 million in 100% funds and the remaining of the, uh, the 350 million you see here is, um, is the 50-50 uh, 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 reimbursement funds. Uh, in 2018, they uh, SNAP ENT served about uh, 458,000 participants, but there's a lot of potential uh, for serving more with uh, about, you know, about 35, 40 million people uh, participating in the SNAP program there's definitely a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, potential for others to be served by this program, by SNAP ENT. <clears throat> uh, and also what this slide shows is basically how the uh, uh, kind of the communication process and, and who is responsible for what. Uh, again, the, the state is primarily responsible for their SNAP ENT program, but when it comes to 50-50, uh, again, uh, the federal government, USDA FNS, provides the, the guidance and the rules, and they provide the funding, which uh, funnels through the state, uh, the SNAP agency. Uh, and then with the third party partners, they, uh, they contract with the state to provide uh, a lot of the services. Uh, uh, in the 50 50 program, uh, many of them put in their own funding that they receive, the non federal funding, uh, to be able to draw down that reimbursement. But again, everything goes through the the SNAP agency and um, and they are primarily responsible for the program and how it runs. Next slide. Uh, part of the process of uh, running a SNAP ENT program, like I said before, is each state has to submit a state plan. And, and uh, basically what goes into the state plan is the state uh, uh, draws out what their vision is for their program, for their SNAP ENT program. Uh, if they have any uh, plans to grow the program during that program year, uh, they'll put that in the state plan. Uh, if they have third party partners uh, that provide uh, services in their in their uh, program, they will uh, explain in detail what those providers and what their role is uh, in their SNAP ENT program. And then what components are going to offer and how many people they plan on serving in each of those components. Just to kind of give you an idea of what the planning cycle is and, and how this works uh, on the ground. Uh, 
the program runs the federal fiscal year, which runs from October to September or the following year. Uh, uh, typically, the partner has to submit their um, their their budget and their plans for providing services uh, to the state, um, usually in June or, or early July. So the state has time to put together all the submissions from all their third party partners and providers um, by by August fifteenth, and that's the due date uh, to FNS. Other things that uh, are considered is uh, that the state is allowed to uh, submit uh, plan amendments during throughout the year. In other words, they don't just do the, the August 15th uh, state plan and that's done. Uh, if things change during the year, then they have the option of submitting a, a plan amendment. Um, and then usually they're, they're, uh, they, they try to do those at least once, once a year. Um, some states may do it more often. Uh, there is no limit as to the number of times they can submit their their plan amendments, but uh, in practicality, it usually once or twice is is about all they can they're able to do because of the the approval process and everything. And uh, bottom line is they can't really commit funds to uh, to their program or to their third party providers until that state plan is approved. And then one of the things that needs to be considered when during this planning process of getting their state plan approved is uh, things like their, their contracting process, the timing for that. So um, it, it may be that they ask that providers provide information earlier than June when they, when they do ask for, for that information, depending on, again, how long it takes their, their contracting process and their approval process for their state plan. Go ahead. I'm gonna ask uh, Eric Hennessy to kind of chime in here and talk about how uh, Nevada does their uh, state plan process and how they uh, kind of run their, their SNAP ENT program. Eric? Hi, uh, my name is Eric Hennessy. I'm a social services program specialist for the state of Nevada, and I oversee the SNAP ENT program for our state. And so, yeah, um, the as Bob explained, the the state plan is is basically our authority. It, from FNS to spend money, right, on SNAP ENT. So we start um, every year, we, we start tracking um, the monthly support services, the 50-50 reimbursements and 100% spending dollars to project um, our annual spending so we can project the, the budget for the for the state plan that's due, as, as Bob said, in, in August, on August 15th. So around uh, March or April, we start drafting the language and building budgets. And at this point we is when we, we would like to see the proposals from any uh, and budgets from any uh, CBOs or community colleges that we, we currently have or prospective ones. Um, um, we we currently right now only have uh, community colleges as our partners um, because we have a, a new thing with the state of Nevada is the RFA process, the request for application that we have to do for non-state agencies. And so that has uh, slowed us down a little bit here as far as uh, growing out to non-state agencies, so CPOs, community-based organizations. So we've we focus mostly on community uh, colleges as our partners. Um, and so, um, and our vision with them is to build uh, short-term stackable certificates with them. And so that's our vision that we, we, we write out in our state plan. And we currently have right now TMCC, Truckee Meadows Community College as a, as a partner. We have uh, CSN. So Truckee Meadows Community College is in Northern Nevada in Reno. Uh, CSN College of Southern Nevada is in Southern Nevada in, in, in Las Vegas. And we also have a third uh, partner, WNC Western Nevada Community Colleges, which is in uh, Carson City, uh, which is Northern Nevada as well. And so we work very closely with those three entities, um, getting the documentation needed, uh, the verifications needed. We ask that, you know, that they, that they look at their budgets, make sure that they have um, non-federal dollars, right, to match to get for the reimbursement, the fifty percent reimbursements, um, and we may, and you know we make sure that they can uh, withhold um, some some delays in payments, right? Because it is a state agency, and we do sometimes take some time between with, with our fiscal agent to get paid. So that's something we, you know, that we have to make sure that they're aware of. And like I said, our, our main goal, though, is, is short term certificates, because most people are on SNAP for six months or less, right? So we want to make sure that we can get 
um, some kind of certificate with them and have them more employable by the end of those six months. So that's that's kind of our goal. Great, thanks, Eric. Welcome. Next slide. So uh, who's eligible for SNAP ENT? Basically it's SNAP recipients who are receiving SNAP in the month they participate in, in a component. And the only exception to that is job retention. So with job, job retention, an individual would have to be participating in a SNAP ENT component uh, prior to their uh, enrollment in job retention. And what job retention means is that the person has become employed and uh, maybe because of their employment wages, they're no longer eligible to receive SNAP benefits, but they could receive job retention services and could be paid for by SNAP ENT up to 90 days uh, after um, they complete and become employed and, and uh, are no longer eligible for SNAP benefits. And also they, they can't be receiving TANF cash assistance uh, and because TANF of course has their own uh, workforce development program. Uh, and they do have to be uh, you know, able to work upon completion of their, their SNAP, uh, SNAP ENT uh, components. There is no time limits for, for SNAP or SNAP ENT. Uh, Unlike TANF, which usually has like a five-year, uh, five-year limit, uh, and states can have you know a lot of flexibility in how they run their program. They can have a mandatory program, a voluntary program. Uh, how they contract for for providers in their program is flexible. I mean, that's a, it's really a, a state thing, an individual state thing. What how they decide to do that. Um, so there's a lot of things uh, that. Um, State has, has a lot of flexibility in, in, in running their program, what components they have and, and who they partner with. Next, next slide. Now we're gonna get into a little bit more about student eligibility in, in a future webinar when we talk about participants in, in SNAP ENT. But I did wanna share this with you that uh, there is a temporary uh, kind of uh, eligibility for, for students, temporary change to eligibility rules for students uh, with the Consolidated Appropri Appropriations Act of 2021, which uh, temporarily expands SNAP eligibility uh, to include that students that are eligible to participate in, in the state or federally financed work study during the regular academic year or as determined by the, uh, by the college, uh, or they have an expected family contribution of zero in the current academic year. Now, what this is different about the, the, the usual rule for that is that the student normally, if they're eligible for a uh, work study program, they would have to actually, you know, have a slot or a spot that they're gonna be going into during that, um, that academic year. So, um, and this is totally separate from participation in SNAP ENT. So, like I said, students have certain rules around their eligibility for SNAP, certain work requirements, uh, but they could be exempt from those work requirements if they're participating in a, a work study program. Uh, but with this uh, temporary expansion, they're allowed to uh, just be eligible for it, not necessarily have a, a slot or, or be participating during that academic year. Next slide. So a little bit about the SNAP p and funding. Uh, the, the, the funding for, for SNAP is, a, is uh, authorized through the Food and Nutrition Act. Uh, there's basically three different funding streams that uh, that states have access to when running their their SNAP ENT programs. There are 100% funds, which are uh, formula funds, and they come from that uh, that 104 million dollars that I spoke about earlier. And those are divvied out to the 50 states, uh, District of Columbia, and two of the um, the U.S. territories. So when you think about that, it, when it's divided up uh, 53 times and it's, it's based on, that formula is based on the number of work registrants they have in their program, uh, including uh, able-bodied adults without dependents, ABODs, uh, then it does, that, that money doesn't go very far in running a program. So the 50-50 the funds are really where, where the, uh, the good opportunity is for, for building a good, strong uh, SNAP ENT program. Uh, and they are the very flexible funding. They can be used for the same thing that 100% funds are used for when running the administrative part of the program, but they also can be used to fund uh, participant reimbursements or what's called for support services uh, to help people overcome barriers to participating in the program and uh, barriers to uh, actually becoming employed. 
Next, next slide. So a little bit more about the 100% funds and what they can uh, cover. Uh, they can cover the, the, uh, your, the, the um, salaries for staff, uh, salary and fringe, uh, and overall planning and operations. Uh, they can go into covering the cost of direct program expenses, things like case management, tuition and fees, and job development. Uh, some of the characteristics of 100% funds is they are, like I said before, they're capped. So there's only a certain amount that each state will get. Uh, and they can't be used to cover uh, participant reimbursements, uh, such as transportation and childcare. Again, those 50-50 funds are for that. Next slide. So like I said before, the 50-50 funds can be used to cover the same things that the 100% funds can be used for. Uh, there's a real potential here for, for colleges to take advantage of those 50-50 funds and using some of their non-federal funds to uh, draw down reimbursements for these different expenses that it's able to cover. Again, uh, with 50-50 funds, you can cover those uh, supportive services uh, such as childcare and transportation. Again, there's a, there's a required upfront investment from, from the college of non-federal funds. They pay for the, the services first and then get reimbursed. Uh, there is no, no cap on those, uh, on those reimbursements. So it really depends on what you're able to put into it and, uh, and uh, in, in allowable services and programs, uh, and then you get reimbursed. And once those reimbursement funds come down to you, they lose their federal status. So they can be reinvested back into the program and uh, again, draw down reimbursements uh, on those funds. So that's a good thing about the 50-50 funds. So uh, as far as third party partnerships and how they work, uh, the state agency contracts with a, uh, uh, with a third party partner, uh, a college or community-based organization. Uh, the services are provided by those third party partners. Uh, and then the, uh, if the third party partner is a college, of course, they get reimbursed 50%, up to 50% through the federal funding uh, on those services they provide. Next slide. And kind of how the funding flows from once the state plan is approved, like I said before, the, the funds can't be uh, uh, authorized and allocated until that state plan is approved. But once it's approved, then those state agency will draw down the, that funding. And uh, once the provider provides services, they will build the state agency and then they get reimbursed um, through this third party partnership. Next slide. Community colleges have uh, the potential to play a big role in the SNAP ENT program. They have a lot of services, a lot of programs that are really a right fit for, for SNAP ENT. They really have, they have those connections to the labor market, so they know what, uh, what jobs in, are available out there and what's, uh, uh, what will make the, the best uh, connection for, for their students as far as the labor market. Um, they do offer career path opportunities where somebody has gets into a career where they not only can you know have get a starter job but also you know grow in their in their uh, their career and be able to get promoted promotions where they get uh, you know some good um, good pay pay increases that helps support them and their family. There's programs in in uh, community colleges we know that uh, help people that are kind of at a pre college level to help them get up to speed and be able to take those, those college courses. Uh, and then also uh, offer programs that are, give some good uh, work experience, such as apprenticeships and, and other uh, things like uh, on the job training and other learning models that'll help them uh, be, become better fit for employment. Next slide. So some of the roles that colleges can play uh, in, in the SNAP employment and training program uh, we have uh, there's opportunities to uh, for intermediaries or a third party partner. Uh, the the state agency uh, could have a contract with a college or a a lead college or a college board as an intermediary to help uh, you know run some of the administrative parts of the SNAP ENT program with uh, other colleges that that are under them. Uh, they could possibly receive 100% funds to help support the administrative oversight of the program and uh, help, help, again, help the state with some of the uh, 
uh, administrative uh, functions of uh, running the SNAP Hinky program. Uh, things like uh, having a, uh, an umbrella contract for all the colleges under, the, under them and uh, you know, uh, running a single, uh, single input for the state plan from all the colleges as well as uh, billing, uh, you know, running a consolidated billing for, for all the colleges. Uh, or they could use their, their own 50-50 uh, you know, funds and contract directly with the state uh, to be a third party uh, partner college. So there's many ways to do this. Uh, this is an important um, function of, of SNAP p &T that, uh, you know, the referral process is really uh, an integral part of getting participants into the program. Uh, there's two basic uh, referral processes. One is the direct referral where the in individual would come in through the state agency and you know, apply for SNAP benefits. And at that point, uh, they are screened for, uh, for their fitness for SNAP e &T. And then if they are fit for the program and the right fit, uh, then they are uh, referred to an ENT provider that will um, in turn assess them and enroll them in, in their services they're providing under SNAP e &T. For the reverse referral process, the individual would actually enter at uh, with the ENT service provider where they're assessed and determine if they're fit for their own ENT services. Then they would, if they are fit, then they would uh, be referred back to the state agency to check their eligibility and then uh, ultimately be enrolled into SNAP e &T. Next slide. And another important part of that whole uh, you know, referral process is determining eligibility for, for the program. And the way it worked is, of course, the college would uh, do an intake on the individual, uh, you know, uh, get, make sure they're, they're fit for their, their programs that they're running, and then also to, uh, check with the state or the SNAP agency to make sure they're eligible for SNAP e &T. Uh, if they are, then they'll be enrolled in their program. They uh, would continue to verify their SNAP eligibility on a mo monthly basis. Uh, and then uh, once they uh, provide those services, then they will be uh, billing the, the SNAP agency uh, for those services that are eligible for reimbursement. And again, like I said, it's, it's an ongoing process where uh, they would el uh, determine eligibility on a monthly basis uh, and then uh, uh, bill the, the SNAP agency, depending on what the billing cycle is, whether it be monthly or quarterly. Next slide. I'm going to turn it over to Susan now to talk about third party partner elements and uh, some other tips and, and uh, things about Pell. Susan. Thank you, Bob. So this, this slide, uh, we ju it just kind of illustrates um, nicely how the kind of the four elements or pillars, you might say, of a SNAP e and third-party partnership. Um, and where they all come together sort of identifies your best opportunity uh, to get reimbursed, uh, that 50% reimbursement, and just kind of where you sort of sit in, in being a solid uh, third party partner. And so um, it's having participants who are eligible and going to benefit from uh, your program, offering services that align with SNAP e &T, uh, having access to those non-federal funds that are that are supporting those, those eligible services, and then having some of the administrative um, capacity in order to administer the program and track uh, on participants and report. So I'm gonna dive a little deeper into each of these uh, topics, these elements, uh, if you will. Uh, next slide, please. So starting with services, um, and uh, we, we use in the SNAP e t world, um, the services or activities that uh, um, someone participates in are called components. So you're going to hear that terminology a lot. And um, there's kind of a, a way to think about, you, know, you have to sort of think about what you're offering and then go through a process to see how your, what you're offering sort of aligns with what Snappy and t has in their sort of menu of components. So thinking about what you offer at the college that's um, E&T aligned, which 
you know, when we we share this information with community-based organizations, they offer a whole, you know, wide array of, of services to, to the community. And sometimes it, it's a little bit more of a process to see that alignment. I think for colleges, it's a little more straightforward when you're talking about your workforce programs. Um, next slide, please. So here we have um, a list of what SNAP e t offers in the way of uh, services and activities. And again, they're called components. Um, this is a full list of, of what's offered under SNAP e t and, um, how, and how, they're, how these uh, components are defined by uh, the USDA. One thing to note is the USDA also requires that case management be integrated throughout any activities. And what that really means is that you need to really be offering some intentional support um, to your SNAP ENT participants as they participate in these activities and be sort of accountable for how they're progressing and helping support them as they progress. Um, not every provider has to offer all of these components. In fact, states have an option to not offer all of those components um, as well. So it's really finding what you're doing already that aligns with uh, these uh, components. And I would say, you know, as colleges, obviously the education component, um, probably what, what they call job search training. So some of those maybe, uh, you know, skills that you, you offer and services that you offer that sort of accompany the, the work skills training that helps people um, you know, um, move forward in, in becoming employed, uh, potentially job search as well. Um, some of these other uh, components might not be well aligned with what colleges offer, but maybe, maybe not. Um, next slide, please. So this kind of shows um, typically how we see alignment with those uh, SNAP e t components. So your education and your workforce programs, anything that's, you know, programs that are leading to employment, offer a career pathway um, and an employer recognized credential. Um, and that includes things like adult basic education, um, things that potentially are pre, you know, pre-college uh, level courses. Um, any sort of vocationalized basic skills training. Um, the, the key is it's, you know, training that's, that's you know, work, workforce and job, you know, employment training in nature. So things that are, uh, that are leading to employment, that's sort of key for what you could include in your SNAP e &T, um, program. And then going down to, you know, the other elements that, uh, are, are already happening on campus that you would be sort of tapping into and um, being sort of intentional around. So you're advising, um, offering that, those, that support to your, your students to help them progress through their, their program, um, being able to track their progress, note when they need support, additional support. And then that kind of leads into the, that last line down there when we call supportive services or participant reimbursement. So it's those um, services that often are key to helping somebody stay engaged in the program, things that they wouldn't, you know, if they didn't have, um, they may not actually be able to participate like transportation, childcare, um, those types of things that are allowed through SNAP ENT that are often key for helping uh, students persist in their education. Uh, next slide, please. So going around this Venn diagram, talk about participants. So uh, Bob talked about basic SNAP e t eligibility. He also talked about student eligibility. So that, that top um, list of, you know, bullet list is just kind of a reminder on, on who, who in your student body would be eligible for SNAP e t um, But then, you know, kind of just going further into that, like understanding how SNAP e t can really support um, your students. So thinking about who might benefit from SNAP e t who, who comes through your doors. So students who might be starting at adult basic education, um, 
Students who've had a negative experience with the education system in the past who don't see themselves as being, you know, even deserving or college bound, um, Snappy and T can offer kind of some of those additional supports that really help them um, recognize their own potential and help them succeed um, where they may not have had a good experience in the past. Um, and again, you know, some of those, uh, the support services like transportation and childcare can be key to be, uh, to help kind of bridge that gap for your students. And then again, um, navigation and case management. So additional, just intentional support for that student. Um, I think it's, it's just really important to remember. So next, I'm going to actually invite uh, Camille from Truckee Meadows Community College to talk more about how Snappy and T can support students and, and her experience and what she's done, um, some innovative things that Truckee Meadows Community College has done with Snappy and T. So I'm going to turn it over to you for a minute, Camille. Hi, my name is Camille Vega, and I oversee the SNAP ET program at our college. We um, first started our relationship with um, DWSS and Eric Hennessy, who just spoke. It was in 2018, and it is now 2020. And I just wanted to, you know, reiterate: it is a very, um, you know, it's a very comprehensive program. There are a lot of different elements that we can provide at a college. Um, to support the students. And it's also been a big learning curve. Um, we're still learning and developing different things to make this a smooth um, transition for our students. Um, as it was discussed before, um, our participants come in um, as a referral from DWSS, but I want to encourage, you know, not only the colleges in Nevada that are starting up, but also the colleges across the country that really the best thing is to identify your current population that are already students, that are already um, Pell eligible or receiving SNAP and provide them the services. Um, as the previous slides have also shown, um, a lot of the services that SNAP ENT participants in this program are needing to receive are already services that the college is providing. We already provide um, you know, career exploration, resume resources, um, resume, you know, making resumes, career services, um, connecting students with employers and education. And I think this is where SNAP ENT is such a good fit for community colleges because the whole idea, again, as Eric and um, Susan have stated, is that we get these individuals employed. So having those stackable programs is really the best place to start. With us, you know, again, in 2018 starting, you know, we really did start a lot of students with short-term certificates, but we have seen once they receive that support to complete a short-term certificate, they're highly likely to continue their education with us. And we're now getting students that are graduating with their associate's degrees. We have students that have been moving on to universities. Um, so I'm not sure exactly. We had some slides with bullet points that I may not be um, covering everything that Susan had kind of, but if you had some specific Susan, I cannot remember exactly, but um, I think that was the big takeaway is really identifying your current students that are already on your campus. Um, it can expand, it's gonna grow, you're gonna get a lot more people. But to start, we definitely started short and sweet and easy because it is a huge program and there's so many different things that we can provide. Um, so in order for us to get our heads around it, you know, it's really being able to do a lot more of that reverse referral. And I think especially now, you know, Susan and Jose, we had chatted about this with the Pell, um, so SNAP eligibility increased to individuals that are now Pell recipients or work study eligible. And I know that there are thousands of students here at our college that are Pell recipients in a CTE type program um, that may not know that they're SNAP eligible. So our big push right now is just even making students aware of that because again, it's not about providing something new or doing something extra, we are already doing this. We already have a educational partnership program is what I'm under and we're already providing these services. 
um, that navigation, the support, and the advocacy to these students. Um, we're just now getting reimbursed by Eric and DWSS for what we're already doing. And once we get that funding, because there are so little, I mean, there really isn't any restrictions on it, we've been able to use it to help students pay for things that there would be no other source of funding to pay for. Um, an example would be, um, you know, if you have a woman that is interested in pursuing education, they're on SNAP, some of the things that are necessary are undergarments, right? And that's something that what other program at a college would be able to provide that to somebody that's interested in going to school, but it's necessary. It's necessary for education, employment, and that's where SNAP ENT funding can really help um, an incoming student or somebody that's interested in pursuing employment. Thank you, Camille. Um, and you, you, hit, you touched on a lot of things and some of it we'll get into um, in the next couple of slides. Um, really appreciate your perspective and, um, and you can say it better than I can in most cases. So I am going to let you have the floor again um, to talk about that stuff. So um, when we, uh, uh, the next kind of circle on our little Venn diagram that we want to cover is capacity. So, you know, this is a federal program. There are reporting and, and tracking requirements. Um, and so that it can't be ignored or, or overlooked um, when we talk about this program. So having the capacity to track data and report on your program and the progress of your participants is really important. And again, this is something I, you know, that colleges do. It, it's figuring out how you sort of weave this work into how you're already doing this. And so you do have a leg up from like other types of SNAP ENT, uh, potential SNAP ENT providers who may not have a very sophisticated system for tracking and reporting. Um, but it's just identifying um, what that capacity is and how you can sort of fold this into your existing capacity. But th these are some of the elements of um, data and reporting capacity. Uh, next slide, please. Um, the other piece of the capacity is the administrative, administrative and fiscal. Um, so documenting how you've spent your funds, managing federal funds, being able to uh, you know, go through an audit and monitoring process, and also um, having the capacity and the sort of internal collaboration with your fiscal staff to develop budgets, to create a process for invoicing. Um, all of that is just uh, another key piece of, of being able to administer SNAP ENT. Next slide, please. So moving around the Venn diagram, uh, funds. Um, Camille, you talked a little bit about this. Um, uh, but so these are some examples of, uh, you know, typical non-federal funds that might be coming to the college that you could be using uh, to draw down reimbursement. So, you know, any funds that are state level and, and it's or originate at the state uh, to support um, students in your college, like worker retraining dollars, um, other low income student supports. Um, tuition set aside resources, uh, funds for target populations that state, states might have certain initiatives to support uh, reentry population or homeless individuals or non-custodial parents. Um, so these are some just some solid examples of, of what types of funding you might be able to leverage. Um, Camille, I know you talked about in our uh, preparation, um, a kind of a unique example of um, uh, funding that you've utilized at Truckee Meadows uh, from your emergency scholarship fund. So I might ask yeah, you to talk about course. that. Somebody um, actually had sent a chat about asking um, what are some examples of the non-federal funding stream. So um, right. I had responded. So the biggest ones are your college scholarship, foundation scholarships. Um, much of those are non-federal. Um, we also have an emergency scholarship program. Again, that's non-federal. And that's a, that's a big one because those are students who obviously are experiencing some sort of emergency that needs funding through your college. And 
if they weren't on SNAP, it's a good opportunity to get a student connected to SNAP. If you're having a financial challenge and you need money to go to school, you may also need additional resources like SNAP benefits or housing. So really the biggest thing that we want to do with our emergency scholarships is to get them connected to long-term resources like SNAP. Um, also different types of state funded legislative programs. An example that we have here is at the same time we received our SNAP ENT, we also received legislative funding for a prison reentry program. And in the state of Nevada, pretty much everybody leaving incarceration leaves with a SNAP card. And of all populations that need employment and training, that's a very you know needed population that needs that. So we use that funding to um, assist with those individuals. We have a displaced homemaker program here, and we use the salary for the time spent on a student that is a displaced homemaker. Um, I think that was the biggest non-federal funding. Oh, it, the other thing I had also mentioned is that you don't need to just use the non-federal funds that your institution has. So there's an example we have, we have a nonprofit agency in town that has a um, state funded scholarship for individuals that are interested in doing a short term career program. It doesn't fall under a college credit program. It falls under more of a community ed, but it's a certification. It's for community health worker. So we are able to leverage that scholarship that this nonprofit gives to our student who is a SNAP ENT student. So you don't always have to just look at what non-federal funds your institution has. I would also encourage you to look at non-federal funds that your student receives that is not from your institution. We have a partnership again with the university in town and they provide scholarships for students interested in drug and alcohol peer support. We don't offer that class here, but we're able to support a SNAP ENT student with our support, our resources, resumes, career hub, all of that, and then leverage that funding that they receive for the scholarship to attend a university program. Hopefully that made sense. <laughs> Thank you, Camille. Uh, next slide, please. So um, SNAP ENT and Pell, um, some things to uh, consider. So, you know, Pell is obviously a significant um, key federal, uh, you know, funding stream to support low income students. And you can't supplant Pell with SNAP ENT. You can't replace um, Pell when it's available for a student with SNAP ENT. That being said, SNAP ENT can, can kick in when Pell is pending. So if a student is applying for Pell and it hasn't been awarded yet, um, then they can you can use SNAP ENT. So maybe that you know first quarter they enroll, they're applying for financial aid, Pell hasn't come through. You could use SNAP ENT to cover their um, their costs in that first quarter, um, or you can use SNAP ENT to cover things that Pell won't cover. So consider, you know, thinking about how you can sort of braid SNAP ENT with Pell or sequence SNAP ENT with Pell is really important. Um, in addition, you know, so if if Pell covers a certain expenses, um, supportive services um, aren't covered. So Pell could cover tuition and SNAP ENT could cover the, you know, the case management and the advising uh, efforts that you're providing to them, as well as, you know, maybe transportation and childcare and, uh, or um, other expenses that aren't covered through Pell. So um, when you think about your students, it's sometimes I think it's assumed that, okay, well, my students on Pell, so they're just, you know, SNAP ENT is off the table. And that's really not the case. It's more complex than that. And so you can and you really can enhance uh, what you offer um, to that student with uh, combining SNAP ENT with Pell. Next slide. Um, so we did have a spot here, Camille, for you to talk a little bit more about Pell. If you have anything you wanted to add, um, please do. Um, I think that one of the best things about the SNAP ENT funding and what we've used it for are students that have 
something going on with their Pell for that semester. So an example would be not meeting academic progress. We also get a lot of um, SNAP ENT participants who may have student loan defaults. Those are two really easy things that we can help with that there would probably be no other funding source. Um, to get back on academic progress, students sometimes have to do a semester to get their grades back up and they may have not been able to complete an appeal or not eligible for an appeal. So that's where SNAP ENT can come in and say, you know, we'll pay for the classes that you need in order to get your grades back up to get you back on Pell. Because as Susan said, we want them to get federal financial aid. That should be their first funding source. Not only is it a long-term solution to their education funding, it's just, it would use up a lot of our SNAP money if all we did was pay tuition. The second, again, is student loan defaults. Both people leaving incarceration and individuals that are lower income, student loans are the last thing that they're going to have funding to pay for. So the agreement a lot of times that we have with people coming in is we will cover your semester while you work on your student loan defaults. And it's really exciting because of both of those situations, that's where, as I was talking about, we're starting to see the graduates, they often came in with that barrier. And this is the best part of SNAP ENT is that because it's unrestricted, we can provide that assistance to get them back on track and see them succeed. Thank you, Camille. I want to uh, keep moving because I know we just have a few minutes left. Um, so uh, really valuable, uh, the, the specifics that you have to add there. Um, just uh, really quickly, you know, these are some tips for success. And I will say that when we talked to Camille, she kind of ran through this whole list too. And when she was talking about their, her experience uh, with SNAP ENT at Truckee Meadows. So these are kind of tried and true. <laughs> um, but you know, start small, start with a small group of students, a small program, maybe one pathway, one program that you're offering to really get uh, a sense for how this works in your college before you, you know, go big, you don't need to start big. Um, collaborate and communicate with your SNAP agency. Um, one of the reasons why we wanted Eric to, to be here to sort of chime in is um, to really stress the importance of, of you know, collaborating, communicating, understanding the goals and priorities of your SNAP agency in your, in your state. Um, you know, again, integrate SNAP ENT into what you already do. Um, all those things are very important and have a mechanism to make sure that your any staff that are uh, playing a part in this really understand the role they have to play and what they need to do. Um, I wanna leave a little bit of time for questions. So I won't go through, you know, every last bullet point here. Um, the next slide, uh, Jose, is just uh, some resources that might be helpful to get a better understanding of SNAP ENT. Um, so those will be available on the slides that we share, but I do wanna open it up to, the, uh, to questions um, since we only have a couple more minutes. So feel free to unmute. You're muted, Jose. Thank you, Susan. I was just <laughs> saying you thought it might be helpful to stop sharing screens so everybody can see each other. Yeah. If you're excited, you can put your questions in the chat as well. We're looking at that. And I would say like the takeaways that I think might be important for you, you know, as you're starting in this cohort is really that, you know, starting small, SNAP ENT can be really big and really impactful, but it's also complicated. So, you know, that I would just reiterate that, you know, think about where you can start that's really manageable and kind of take the training wheels off and go bigger um, as you go. That's a really, uh, you know, sound approach. You don't need to come in with this giant budget um, right off the bat. It tends to uh, be a lot to take on. And I'm sure Camille mentioned this already, but she mentioned it to us when we were chatting before this conversation. And I just want to reiterate, if there's one thing for you all to think of, especially those of you that are 
either recently became providers or are thinking about becoming providers is start small and build up. That way it's more manageable. Um, if there's no other questions and I'm giving you all until 3 p.m. Eastern time, otherwise I'll give you all back your 15, 15 minutes to your day. Um, there was a question earlier that came in uh, privately about whether this session would be available after. Yes, um, so we're recording this the session. We'll make it available to you all afterwards for you to revisit. Um, the presentation will also be available. We have a, a SNAP ENT 101 session already in our website at acct.org. We're hoping that this one is a little bit more in depth, gives you a little bit more um, more perspective as a from the community college side, and also that it's helpful for you to hear from your peers and from a state agency representative to see what it's like from their end and what they're expecting from you as you go through the process. I have a quick question. Can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Awesome. Okay, Camille, what was some of the programs that you guys saw the most success with these students? Because, you know, for those of us that are at community colleges that have lots of options, right? And that's always what you think of, well, oh, I want to offer it all. And everybody's saying start small. So no, that is actually a really good question. So when we started, um, as Jose had mentioned, we started with just one program, and that was our uh, manufacturing program. And what I think the best, and it's different, right, for each college, what you guys offer, but I would look at your short-term stackables. So things that students can do in one semester, we want them to continue. I, we all believe in higher ed, but sometimes they're on SNAP for a short period of time. They may not have had traditional high school um, education. So a long-term college, you know, four-year degree can seem very overwhelming if you're just starting. And we want small successes. Even if you just get them into an one credit OSHA class, that counts for DWSS as a career training, and they've completed a one credit OSHA. And the pride and satisfaction they get from completing that is amazing. And they are now interested in going further. The um, good thing about our manufacturing program, it's on an open entry um, basis. So that's the other thing to keep mindful of when you start this program is trying to identify as many of your programs that don't fall in the traditional semester because you're going to get um i guess if you already have your students and you're dipping into your current student population it doesn't matter but as you start getting referrals from dwss or other agencies they're going to come in at all different times in the semester so i really look at some of those programs that students can get into right away. And for us, there are things like manufacturing, welding, HVAC, automotive. Um, those are the big ones that I would say are those open entry classes. And the reason, again, is individuals may not be on SNAP for long periods of time. Sometimes they are interested today, but telling them to come back six months from now is not very helpful. Um, but also part of SNAP ENT that was on one of the slides are all the other things that they could be doing before semester starts. And what we try and do is have everybody do a resume. If you don't have one, let's work on your resume. We have our financial aid can provide financial aid um, webinars or not webinars, you know, like info meetings through our financial aid department that could be done. Um, they could do other things. We also have something called Getting Ahead. Some people may know about it based on Bridges Out of Poverty. We can provide other non-academic programs to support student success. Um, so I, yeah, that would be the first thing to really look at are what are your short-term stackable courses and the best ones are the open entry so that Absolutely. you have options for them if they come in today and say, I wanna do this. That um, program I was telling you about for the drug and alcohol peer support that's offered through the university and our community health worker is provided through our community ed. What I like about those two is I do often get people come in and they want to go into counseling. And we know counseling is often a six year full time, maybe 12 years part time, right? It's a long time. And you're getting a SNAP participant and to tell them you could totally do this 
but it's going to take 12 years, again, is very defeating, right? They have to get working tomorrow. Um, and again, the other thing is give them those short little successes that they can do in a couple months. That's why I really like the drug and alcohol or community health worker. So also looking at other options for long-term programs and they complete a community health worker, drug and alcohol, they can still go to college. We can still support them for those 12 years, but we try and identify something that they can do right away, get their feet, foot in the door, um, see if they're even interested. And oftentimes they are, and they wanna continue, which is great. But Eric likes success, successes. So we try and give our DWSS office successes as well. You know, it's a partnership with them and we're all here to serve the same population. Yeah. And there, is there somewhere we can see the data on employment after they do this? So that would probably be your partnership with the DWSS office. Um, we do some follow-up. I mean, I think with SNAP e t the unique thing about it is we're so involved in their lives. Um, when they are on SNAP, we learn all sorts of different things about them and they want to come and tell us they got employed. So sometimes we have that information, but again, we're starting small. We definitely don't have, you know, thousands of students in SNAP e t so it's easy for us to get that feedback. But I think that's where DWSS um, is the one that can track that easier. Eric, do you, I think you know this, you can look this up. Maybe it's not there. You might have stepped away. Sorry, I'm here. No, I'm here. I'm, oh, yes. I'm sorry, I, I was muted. Have, you have the ability to look up and see employment for folks after they can complete SNAP e &T. Yeah, um, so what we, we have an annual report actually that's due to FNS um, every year by the end of the year, right? Um, annual, obviously. <laughs> But um, and where we have to track all SNAP ENT uh, participants for after they leave the, uh, the the program, and we report on employment the second and fourth quarters after leaving the program. So yeah, we definitely have that data. Oh, thanks. Uh huh. Any final questions before I let you all go? I just want to tell Bob that I live in Thibodeau. I just think it's so funny. <laughs> Love reading that last name. <laughs> this is not the first time I'm here about to hear this. <laughs> no, sure it's not. <laughs> well, I just want to thank you all again for making time for this and, and being um, engaged, asking questions. Uh, we'll make this recording available. Um, I think Jose may have. I thought I froze, but I guess it was <laughs> I think it would. I think Jose froze. We'll make this. Um, I'll go ahead and finish what I'm pretty sure he was going to say. Uh, we'll make this recording available as soon as possible. We may have to, you know, tweak it down or you know what you have to do with videos sometimes to make it work. Um, but I, it, on behalf of Jose, I think this was a great first kickoff, and I'm really excited for our next one. Um, if you have any questions please feel free to reach out to um, Jose, myself, Bob, or Susan, and we're happy to help in any way that we can. I hope you all have a great afternoon. Bye, everybody. everybody thank thank you. you, Camille. Thank you, Eric. Thank you, guys. Bye-bye.